Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. This time on Broad and High. Zanesville aims to recapture a part of its rich pottery history with a prize like no other. We're working to bring people here to compete for the largest prize ever in the history of the Western Hemisphere. And we'll share the sweet rewards of beekeeping. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan, your host for Broad and High, the ultimate intersection of arts and culture, where we explore the character and creativity not only in Columbus, but across the country. Zanesville is often considered to be the pottery capital of the world, so it's only fitting that the city established the Zanesville Prize for Contemporary Ceramics. This September, 100 finalists were selected from among thousands of entries worldwide to compete for a Best in Show award of $20,000. The event included workshops by world-renowned ceramic artists, further demonstrating that contemporary ceramics are here to stay for both dabblers and experts alike. The Zanesville Prize is a prize that is for contemporary ceramics. Zanesville is known for ceramics. It was the pottery capital of the world, so nicknamed the Clay City. So to recreate what our strength is, we're working to bring people here who have an interest in contemporary ceramics to compete for the largest prize ever in the history of the Western Hemisphere, 20,000 Best in Show Prize. Zanesville was a ceramic capital in the late 19th, early 20th century, and it was really a confluence of, for a lot of reasons. So we had the clay deposits here geographically, and we also had a means for transportation so that that work, that you know, creative work, could be distributed throughout the United States and actually throughout the world. So it was kind of a natural geographic reason to have ceramics located here in Zanesville. You know, this is the perfect time in history to have an event like this, especially in Zanesville, because there's a real renaissance in contemporary ceramics making right now. Whether it's utilitarian traditions that are more modern, cups and saucers and mugs, done in really innovative and interesting ways, or the more sculptural, figural forms in contemporary ceramics, which are on display here. You know, there's just a real vibrant, eclectic mix of work that really makes this a unique time and place to have an event like this this here in Zanesville. So we're thrilled to have it. I mean, if you look in the gallery space itself, you can see that range of work and excellent work. Not only do you have a series of emerging artists that are coming up through the ranks and who will be the next great ceramic artist community, but you also have really beautifully established artists on display. And where can you get that kind of an opportunity to really see that all in one place? We have uh, another event, a conference here, in which we have six master ceramists coming in to do a series of demonstrations. And we're inviting people from all over the country and all over the world to come in and learn from them. The demonstrations include one by John Balistrieri, who does large-scale ceramic work. So it would be kind of overwhelming when people come in and see this huge thing being constructed over the course of the three days that he's uh, going to be here. 
The Pottery Symposium offers clay novices or people just dabbling in clay or even people who are experts in clay to have a workshop with a behemoth in the field. And John Balistrieri is that. He creates these really wonderful monumental works on clay. Now we won't be creating that um, as workshop participants, but we'll have the opportunity to see what that's like and to you know, take home with us from an exhibition like this, from the symposium like this, we'll be able to take home some of the skills and techniques that we'll learn from this really giant in contemporary ceramics. What we have done is we are focusing uh, the attention of the ceramic world on Zanesville. And this is fitting in with our tradition. It's something that the businesses and foundations here have supported, and we're getting political support as well. We really are doing everything that Les Wexner said in a, in a speech that I heard that you have to do to make art into a tool of economic development. So we, we care about ceramics, but we also care about our community. We want to attract people here. We want young people, old people to come here, people who have skills, people who are novices. When you think of Zanesville and ceramics, you think of more of the production pottery that took place during the turn of the century and the pieces that were, some of them were handcrafted, but many of them were actually mass produced. So Zanesville is really known for that, but having a contemporary prize here that deals with contemporary ceramics and the work that's coming out today really puts a new focus for Zanesville. And that's what makes this prize so interesting. And it is the inaugural year. So to have it again and again and again for, and to support really ceramic artists and their work work to create really innovative forward-looking work it's it's huge um, just it's huge for Zanesville but it's huge actually nationally for the United States to support ceramic arts and this is our first year we're learning a lot of lessons but what has happened is people have come out in, in just fantastic numbers to support our efforts, which is, shows that this community was ready to do this probably 25 years ago, but it's doing it now. See the ceramic works of the finalists, including the prize winners, at zanesvilleprize.org. Honey Run Farm is a small family-run farm near Williamsport, Ohio. Operated by the husband and wife team of Jane and Isaac Barnes, they make the most out of their bee byproducts, from 100% pure raw honey and bee pollen to handcrafted soap and beeswax candles. What started as a hobby has since evolved into a successful business and way of life. From hive to home, we're going to show you just what all the buzz is about. Look at that. That makes me a happy beekeeper. So uh, the main thing we do is produce honey. I'm gonna pull this frame out. I think this is solid honey. Yeah, this is all honey here. Here you can see a little pollen. That yellow stuff, that orange stuff is goldenrod pollen. And that's their protein. The honey is their carbohydrate. This is good, good to see because this means they're going to make it through the winter. Well, <laughs> Jane and I work at Honey Run. <laughs> it's a small family business. We have four kids. Um, they're all six and under. Growing up, I was always around my parents working together on the farm and I think that helped influence my choice to be wanting to be on a farm so that my kids could be around me, see what we do, help out. Uh, after college, I uh, met Jane and she says that I mentioned to her that I wanted to keep bees and I don't even remember that, but um, she for Christmas got me a, a beehive. Yeah, so I put it together and started reading about it and got interested in that first summer, uh, we ended up having two hives. And this didn't really become a business until about 2008 or 9. we started selling the honey at farmer's market. Eventually we were up to like 150 to 200 hives and in 2011 I quit teaching and this is what we've been doing since. 
it's been a slow process, but we're up to near 400 hives now, and I, I'm hoping we'll be up in the 500 range next year. This is the brood chamber where the queen and the, and the brood are going to make it through the winter. The excluder is called a queen excluder. It's shaped basically to where the bees uh, can come up, but the queen is too big to get up through there. And that prevents her from laying eggs and having a brood nest up in these top chambers. These top chambers are called honey supers, and you know, you hope that the bees fill it up with honey. And that's what we'll harvest here today. Oh, that looks great too, you know. This is chock full of honey. The bees have got this honey, you know, pulled out as far as they can, and it's goldenrod honey. In the summer, it's a different color, it's uh, more white. And uh, if it's got a strong clover flow, it's like snow white. But this is more yellow, and it's goldenrod honey. We pull honey spring, summer, fall, and as the flowers change, you have a different taste in the honey. In the bottle of fall, it's a little darker look, and that's just the honey looks darker, and it's mostly from the goldenrod. The bees are foraging on goldenrod, and then the aster comes on, and the taste of that honey is going to be way different from the summer. Uh, it has a more rich, butterscotchy taste. Um, and that's just because the nectar of the goldenrod is different than the nectar of, say, clover in June. You know, the bees are collecting honey for them. It's not for us. And so they, they have all these carbohydrates ready for winter. And in our case, if we steal the fall honey from them, which they need, we've got to supplement it with something. I rob them of their good box of honey on top. So you uh, supplement it with feed for one. If it's warm enough, liquid feed works fine. This stuff is a, a mixture of sugar and water and um, basically a, a lemongrass uh, and minty essential oils. It's, it's good for the bees going into winter. This is a protein patty. These are protein sugar mix and um, and I'll put that in the brood chamber for them to eat. I've fed them a lot of protein this summer. The bees look better than I've ever seen. So that box alone weighs a good 50 or 60 pounds. And they're still pulling in goldenrod and aster honey. So I'm, I'm not in much danger of starvation here, but I'm going to give them a, a box of food anyway. We really can't separate home from work. It's all enmeshed together. The honey is all bottled and processed in the honey house, which is just a couple steps out the back door. Bees, bees everywhere. And that's our, our man Leif out there. He does a great job. Uh, he'll pull frames of honey out and run it through what's called an uncapper. And the uncapper takes the wax capping that the bees have put on there, takes it off. And that goes on a whole nother route um, and becomes you know, candles eventually. But the honey frames, we've got these frames of honey, they go into the extractor. And it's just a big centrifuge. It spins them round and round, and the honey spins out. The honey, it goes into a settling tank. You know, starting out, um, I, I didn't realize how important a settling tank was, and it's really important. Uh, the honey sits in there for a day or two, and the, the stuff, it's called slum gum, beekeeper lingo, it, it rises to the top, and it's just this uh, old waxy air bubbles, it's this layer that rises to the top of the settling tank, and the honey is then bucketed up out of the bottom of the settling tank. And that makes for nice, pure, golden honey. And at that point, we can, we can pump it up into our bottling tanks. I grew up in a Mennonite house, and so everything, uh, we did a lot of making things from scratch, keeping things very simple. The, the products from the honeybee really are amazing because they all get used. So the honey can be extracted, whatever is excess honey that the bees don't need, we can take can be used to eat, but also put into soap and lip balms and things like that. Um, and then the beeswax, which is used as we scrape that from the, the comb, 
we can clean that, render it down, it can be used as a candle, put in the soap, put in the beeswax lip balms. Um, so really, there's no hive product that is thrown out. It's all reused. I plan on building hives until it kills me. I, I love this job. So. Learn more about Honey Run Farm, see which stores stock their products, and find their recipe for pawpaw honey ice cream on their website at honeyrunfarm.com. Honey is also the primary ingredient in the ancient beverage known as mead. The apple pie mead from the Short North Meadery Brothers Drake is affectionately referred to as dessert in a glass. With a recipe that includes apple cider, wildflower honey, and some quintessential apple pie spices like cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves, it embodies all that we love about this time of year. We met up with the team at the meadery to find out what makes their apple pie mead so popular. Take a look. Brothers Drake is an urban meadery. We take local produced, uh, local farm stuff, mainly honey of course, being that mead is fermented honey, and we turn that into to honey wine. So we take all wildflower honey from central Ohio, typically Marysville, Plain City area. It takes us about a year to make anything we make. A lot of mead makers produce mead in two weeks. Uh, we can have 13% alcohol, which is our target number, in two or three weeks. We just want to take more time to get the flavors and the balance and to get the dryness we're looking for a lot of times. We'll bring in Brad's Honey. It's Brad's Bees out of Marysville. I think we did 30,000 pounds last year, roughly. We need to get it into a tank and mix it. So we mix that up with water, just for a traditional. We mix it up with water. We mix it very well so all the honey is dissolved. Uh, and then we pitch our yeast onto there. So for the first week, they're divided into smaller containers. It ferments down about a third of the way, and then we merge it back into the big tank, and then it ferments down the rest of the way. So to talk about apple pie, I'll have 900 gallons of fresh cider in the building, ready to go. We mix it with honey, about three pounds of honey for every gallon of cider, and then we spice it with cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove. By far our most popular drink, I think it's becoming known as Ohio's holiday beverage, which is kind of a really nice thing. This is our first batch of apple pie for next year. It's bubbling away. Um, the yeast is going around eating all the sugar, and it's producing carbon dioxide, which is what the bubbling is. Temperature kind of indicates how well the fermentation is going. Uh, you don't want it too low because then the, uh, the yeast are going to lie dormant, uh, but too high the yeast will actually start dying off. I'm also doing a pH reading. Acidity is also fairly important with uh, fermentation as well. Uh, this is a measure of what's called specific gravity, um, and that's basically the density in relation to the density of water. The amount of sugar that goes in there is going to raise that number, so you'll take essentially two readings, one at the very beginning of fermentation and one at the finish. And then from there, you'll, you'll subtract a difference. You'll be able to kind of plug that into a formula and see what the ABV is uh, going to be. People walk in uh, sometimes a little confused. They don't really know what to do or how to order or anything of that nature. I usually like to start people with a little taste of Wild Ohio because it's the most traditional, it's just fermented honey. We offer a sampler which covers five of our most popular meads and like the whole range from sweet to dry and everywhere in between. Even if you're not up for the whole sampler too, we're happy to give you like a little taste of something you're interested in because it's so different, nobody else is doing it. So we decided as a business, it's okay, let's go ahead and bring liquor and beer and other things here so other people can enjoy this place that don't enjoy mead. Where we drew the line was on the local part. It's got to come from Ohio. We at least have to stick to this core value of buy, make, and sell local. So when you come here and you have a, you know, a martini with vodka, you're having a Ohio vodka. Our neighbors make that. We see that money stay in our community and circulate around Fifth and High. I mean, this has become a really positive place to hang out in the city when five years ago it really wasn't. We make friends here. I don't know. That's that's part of bartending here that I really like a lot. Is that, like, we're trying to make friends. We want people to come back and we want them to feel comfortable here. I guess it's just been a real humbling experience to kind of watch this grow around us, uh, being that it started with four of us up all night making meat and trying to find a way to serve it during the daytime.
can schedule your own private tour of the meadery and learn how they turn honey into wine at brothersdrake.com. Getting into the details of an artist's process is one way to connect more deeply with art. For artist Stephen Slasky, an understanding and love of buildings is evident in his drawings of locations around Milwaukee and Chicago. But it's his interest in live music that has greatly inspired his latest collection of watercolor and pen and ink drawings. Enjoy this segment from our friends at Milwaukee PBS. To me, it's always been almost a, a compulsion to draw. I feel like I'm primarily an observer, then I capture what I see in my own, my own style. My name is Steve Slasky, and I'm an artist. I mean, it seems like I've, I've been drawing pretty much my whole life. I'd say I started out just drawing everything around me, but but I developed a particular interest in architecture. Visually, just the excitement of the man-made environment that we created. I have a degree in architecture from the University of Wisconsin. So, I mean, I, I always, I had that, I thought architecture was a way of combining my interests in, in, in buildings and in drawing. I started out being very interested in a lot of the historic buildings in, in Milwaukee. I had done the Miller House and the J Judge Jason Downer House on the corner of Prospect and Juno. Because I was just inspired by the history of those buildings. The excitement of what we've created, the man-made created, contrasted with the natural environment. And I think also a part of my work has been the contrast of the of the new with the old. The uh, the historic architecture with modern architecture that I find very exciting. What you're seeing in the piece is 23 drawings from what has become over 300 drawings that I've done in concert settings. Some of the earliest ones were at St. John's Cathedral in Milwaukee. So the title of this piece is Drawing Music and it, in various places, mainly the Chicago Cultural Center, where I go almost weekly to, to draw in that setting. It's a beautiful setting in the old Chicago Public Library. I like the combination of drawing during a concert, letting the music flow as part of the drawing. I've found through this process that, that the music really does feed my, my artistic output. Most of these drawings, I give myself the time of the concert, which is less than an hour, to complete one of these drawings. You're capturing the artist, the environment, you're surrounded by the music, you feel the energy from the artist, you're there among the people listening. It's the entire experience. I generally start with the musicians. I am so taken with that space that I've drawn it from every angle now. But I've always done this uh, as part of my travels, too. I've always been inspired by the, by what's around me. And when I travel, I always find you know, exciting new places to be. These drawings that I do there, it captures a moment in time that I find really exciting. I like to draw when I travel and capturing different cities and their skylines. It just seemed like a natural thing for me to do. Of the skylines, I did one of the uh, Chrysler Building in New York, which was exciting to me because it was a combination of an actual scene and creating a piece using a model I had built of the Empire State Building as a vantage point for this drawing. So I started out doing my, doing my drawings and adding color to those drawings. Over time, you know, the color got bolder, I started doing just paintings in color, getting away from the line. But I always end up going back to drawing, which I feel like is, is so, such an intrinsic part of my work. The mural behind me is actually funny because it's, it's the back of the band shell in Millennium Park, which throughout the summer season in Chicago, there's free concerts there all summer long. The idea behind these murals was to depict different Chicago neighborhoods, particular scenes of Chicago, Chicago architecture. One of my favorite exhibitions that I've done is uh, a show of portraits drawn from life. 
from live sittings, taking this thing we've talked about with buildings and applying that to the dynamic drawing another person and capturing them in a drawing that was done directly in ink, not sketching it out first in a limited time period. That was very exciting to me. Drawing is so important to all aspects of art. You might not see things as drawing based, but you know, you have to be able to draw to communicate your ideas, put it out there and be okay with it. Just letting line and color flow. Believe in what you do. That's our show. To see more of today's stories, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. This week, we're listening to the sounds of local hip-hop artist Vicky B and a track off her 2014 album, Atlas. We'll see you at the ultimate intersection of arts and culture next week on Broad and High. Boy, you got me sprung. See, I'm normally not that girl, but you got the right words in lieu of all the smear and off the takeoff. Heard you got a nice car. Heard you got some nice things you've been wanting me to see on the real, though. I'm digging your style. Let's be real, though. Could you make it worth my ride? Cause you got your hand right in it. Goosebumps in my arms, neck, and my backside If I let you take me home, will you call me in the morning? Will you tell all your friends? Will you say what we have done? Will you tell them how I've been? Will you say how far we're thrown? Will you tell them how you ball? Will you say how much you grow? Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council. Supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com.